We're now starting the 315 presentation, Defeating Social Engineering with Voice Analytics by Doug Money. Do I need to move the mic up or can everybody hear me okay? Everybody got me? You got me good? Good in the back? Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about where I'm coming from. Um, I'm going to talk about um, voice analytics, defining that, talk about the applications of voice analytics. Um, today in the real world, and then take some of those real world models, um, templates, and then apply them to using voice analytics, um, that technology, um, as a defense against um, social engineering attacks. Uh, by no means. Um, defeating is probably a little bit of an extreme word, especially considering how creative people can be. Um, I should change that to defend. All right, where am I coming from? Um, I've been the news and online editor for um, Vaughn Magazine for about three years. We cover uh, VoIP and IP communications. Remember that. We're going to come back to that in a second. We also I also cover security issues and enterprise issues. Um, if you want a real world consultant on IT security issues, go hire one. It's not me. I'm going to talk about voice analytics. What is it? Again, talk about how features of voice analytics are being used um, in the corporate sector for security purposes today and then applying voice analytics as a defense layer against social engineering attacks. So voice analytics, what is it? Um, definition, uh, basically it's analyzing the spoken content of, you know, I'm going to go on a limb here and say recorded conversations. Mostly we mean telephone conversations. Um, you'll also see vendors refer to their solutions and they'll talk about speech analytics. It's the same thing. It's being able to look at a, um, a, a voice conversation um, either off the phone or on the radio in some cases um, and pulling out data out of it um, in order to do useful things. For this presentation we're going to talk about voice print identification. We're going to talk about word spotting that is actually plucking out or identifying words within a um, conversation. Talk about emotion detection a little bit um, and then we'll talk a little bit about talk analysis um, where um, companies look at words they've spotted, emotion detection, and it combined all that with um, call data and statistical analysis to come up with some um, interesting findings, um, especially in the call center world. Uh, basically, you can think of voice analytics as data mining phone calls. I really didn't mean the NSA, but um, I want to take a, put this into perspective. Um, the, the legend of Echelon um, is a national security agency slurps up all overseas phone calls. Um, then massive computer farms scan those calls for keywords and voice prints. Um, there's been speculation that the US government has had this capability as early as 1982, if you look at um, the work by Jim Banford, The Puzzle Palace. Anybody read that? Yep. You got one person. Yeah, I got one person in the back hiding. Um, and then um, later on, you had a, a report of the Echelon program um, between 1999 and 2000. Um, so, you know, if you want to go and assume that 1982 is the earliest capability, there's been about 24 years plus or minus of, of uh, development of, of being able to go into phone calls and, and pulling out um, yeah, keywords. But the reality today, it, it's, it's a lot more corporate. Um, corporate America has its own echelon program. And what do I mean by that? Um, voice print. And voice analytics are in use in call centers today. Um, and again, the big users are call centers. Um, and call centers, you know, what do I mean by a call center? Um, basically, um, anytime you make a phone call um, for customer service, um, or it's not sent overseas, um, even sometimes when it is sent overseas, um, you know, for technical support or for billing problem or things like that, it goes into a call center. Um, Call centers are using voice analytics technology for fraud detection and fraud prevention. They're using it for operational efficiencies, for doing things like training, for call escalation. And more and more, they're mining that data that they're collecting from the thousands and thousands of calls they give every day. They're mining it for real-time business intelligence. They're able to look at um, the text, in essence, of, um, uh, of, of, of what happens when people call in. And they're able to spot things like competitors' offers, 
or problems in their uh, customer service. Um, multiple vendors out on the market, and I was really surprised once I started looking into this, multiple vendors right now are, are building parts and pieces of, of speech analytics, voice analytics solutions for the call center market. Um, and then also call monitoring is also used for regulatory compliance in the financial and healthcare industries. And I'll get into a little bit more of that later. Um, but basically when you start talking about things like HIPAA and Sarbanes-Oxley and get the lawyers involved, people get the lawyers make people very paranoid and they suddenly think that they have to record everything because if they don't, they don't have their, their bases covered. So why do call centers do that record calls and, and look at the, the, the inbound calls? Well, basically, with the call center, efficiency is everywhere. Somebody calls in, it's costing you money. Um, for the phone call, it's costing you time for the person who answers the call. So call centers want to be able to get um, service calls uh, customer calls resolve faster, they want happier customers, and they want lower costs. And call centers have built these large data collection mechanisms, um, basically because disks are cheap, processors are cheap, and um, you know, the software, the secret sauce, well, that's a little bit more expensive. But um, they can record all the calls coming into their call centers, tens of thousands of calls per day, and then run a batch job at night and look at, um, uh, generate uh, statistics off of those calls that they can use to uh, tweak the business the next day. Um, voice analytics, like I said, it, it, it allows companies to spot, has, is already today allowing companies to spot competitive trends, um, what their competitors are doing um, in real time, basically. Enabling technologies. Um, everybody's running IP, everybody's talking about IP PBXs these days. Um, and once you turn something into bits, the next step from turning something into bits is you can do anything with it. Um, over the last two to three months, there's been a flood of press releases from different vendors um, saying that they'll give you a software module, but they'll give you a 1U rack mount box that you can plug into your um, data center rack, and you can record all the phone calls that goes on within uh, within the business. Um, and um, what you're starting to see is that um, as IP PBX vendors um, need more features to um, sell their products, um, a recording capability is going to get built into um, IP PBXs as a standard feature. Right now, most companies, it's an add-on, it's a third-party add-on. You go buy your soft, you go buy your IP PBX, you buy, you buy your third-party software package, you, you plug the two things in, and then all of a sudden all the calls um, within a business are, are recorded and written out on the disk. Um, and again, cheap processors, cheap disks. Um, you can store everything, you can analyze everything. Um, software is off the shelf. Like again, like I said, there are many vendors who, who um, are doing voice print identification, and they're also um, the more sophisticated upper end types are doing um, uh, analysis. So if you're already recording calls for regulatory purposes, or if you're already recording IP phone calls for um, what they call quality assurance purposes, um, being able to take that data and mine it is the next step. Okay, and again, like I said, contact centers, they want to data mine all the thousands of phone calls that come into them on a daily basis. Um, financial institutes, um, banking and insurance, um, especially are starting to use voice analytics um, as a filter mechanism to spot um, cons. We'll get a, um, and, uh, insurance fraud. I'll get into more of that a little bit later. And then commercial organizations want to ensure their confidentiality of their data. So I want to talk a little bit about voice print identification and, and some of the other features, um, of the things you can do with calls. Um, and then I'm going to put it all together in a package later on. Um, voice print identification is probably the thing that we're most familiar with. Um, you know, uh, the voice is my voice is my password type of thing. Um, sneakers, everybody see sneakers? Yes. No. Um, where you've got a unique digital pattern to your voice, and it's a biometric means of identifying somebody based upon the sound of your voice. Um, and there are multiple co commercial solutions available um, for password replacement, um, and then they're starting to get plugged into organizations. Um, such as nuances, um, things speak for verification. Um, getting rid of a password um, and using voice print identification is very attractive for a lot of companies. Um, and I'll get into why in a, in a couple of slides. But um, Nuance, for instance, claims that they have over 150 million secure calls, whatever that means, annually, um, out of their customer base. And then 
the people using them are financial services, telecommunications, utilities, um, transport, and manufacturing. What are the commercial benefits of using voice print ID? Well, guess what? You get rid of um, pass, pins and, and, and password administration. Um, and it sounds like a trivial thing and, and until you scale from, uh, you know, from 10 people using, you know, having to deal with 10 people with user IDs and passwords to tens of thousands of people um, that have passwords or pins, um, all of a sudden you've built yourself a very, when you have many, many thousands of people, you built yourself a big administrative headache because people are going to lose passwords. People are going to forget passwords. They don't use them for a while. Um, and then having to reset passwords, you know, it, it takes time. So companies see that they can get savings um, if they, they use voice print ID because they don't have to have an agent on the phone going through the verifying, okay, what's your, what's your, uh, what's your mother's maiden name? When were you born? What's your dog's favorite name? They don't have to go through all that. They've got voice print on file. People aren't going to lose their password. Um, voice print also provides a, another means of identifying someone. So there's, they're reducing the potential for fraud and identity theft um, if they've got a documented voice print and they can use voice print to um, verify your, your ID, verify who you are. Um, How's it used? Basically, um, you authenticate your identity the first time around. You'll make a baseline voice print or uh, train a, a recognition um, uh, package of some sort uh, by ser uh, set, um, selective vocabulary. You read off a set of words, basically. Um, insurance companies are using voice print more and more for, for whitelisting and blacklisting people. Um, whitelisting means that if you called your insurance agent once before at a call center, and he's got the call on file, well, he's got your voice print on file. So if you call back and you say, um, I've got a claim you know, on my house, my house just burned down, you can go look back um, you know, six months ago and, and, and take a look at, at you know, when you're having a conversation the first six months ago when you're setting up your insurance, look at when you're making the claim now and you're very far that, oh, yes, you're the person who has the insurance policy with us. Conversely, um, insurance companies are using voice print for blacklist for spotting known bad actors. And they're starting to use this in combination as in building big databases. Um, if you look at some of the reports of Katrina fraud, you know, you get one guy who you know, makes 10, 15, 20 claims. It's the same guy who's just calling in to different people at different times. He's got different address, i.e. a different post office box. Of course, he's homeless from Katrina, so of course he's got a home post office box. He's got a different story. He's got a different ID, but his voice print's the same. If you've got all those calls recorded coming into a call center, you can filter out and you can look at, hey, wait a minute, this guy is calling in three or four different times, but he's got four different names. Something's wrong. We need to look into that. Um, more and more, you're likely to see a voice print start to proliferate for more consumer financial uses. Um, such as verifying your ID for credit card um, or some uh, banking applications in the next few years, um, just because all you have to do is speak and they know who you are. Again, you don't have to go through this uh, multi-minute thing of identifying your social security number, your mother's maiden name, you know, or whatever. You don't have to remember that either. Um, again, plenty of vendors offering this, and then you know, making the claims that you implement uh, voice print as a password replacement. Uh, you reduce your admin expenses and um, cut down on your live agent um, support. You don't have to have many, as many people answering the phones. Word spotting. Um, word spotting is interesting. You can take a recorded phone call, and then um, what you need, and I'm going to wave my hands a little freely here because it's a lot more difficult than, than, than I talk about here, but you reach into um, a recorded phone call, then you turn the um, text, you turn the speech into text. Okay, um, pulling text, pulling speech, turning speech into text is difficult, but um, if you've got the right algorithms, and a lot of people have been building up um, some very proprietary and very sophisticated engines in, in order to do this, you take this conversation, you turn it into text. Well, once you've got it in text, you can index it, and then you can search for it and you look for keywords. Um, when you're looking for, you know, once you've got it into text, you're all you're good. Um, so you can take a conversation, 
that's been digitized and, and turned into text being looked for single words, your phrases, multiple phrases, depending upon how detailed, how sophisticated you want your rule set to, to be. Um, word spotting is the hot tool for contact centers right now because, they, of course, they star all the conversations with, with agents. You know, you, you, you call into a, a call center and you go, you hear your call may be monitored at any time, or this call is monitored for quality control purposes. Well, they're recording it. No two ways about it, they're recording it. It's getting stored on a disk somewhere. Now, what's happening is that um, they can dig through all those calls on a batch job every night, and they can find good experiences, the wow experiences. You can find bad experiences. How many people have uttered profanity when they've been on the phone with a, contact, with, with a call center? Oh, come on. Yeah, I see. Yeah, there ought to be at least a quarter of those hands that will fess up to it. Um, you know, when you look at, you know, profanity along with looking at emotion detection, being able to spot spikes in people's voices based upon tone or spot the emotion in somebody's voice, um, they can, you can filter out an index on that as well. Um, and then, of course, again, competitors offer, so you're looking at a lot of that. FedEx. You call FedEx and you go, wow! Um, you're likely to end up to being uh, a call of the month for somebody. You might actually end up earning somebody at FedEx a bonus. FedEx searches all inbound calls to their call center for wow, not oh wow, this is cool, man. They look for the word wow several times um, within their recorded calls, and they look for that emotion spike. They're looking for people who are really impressed with a, with, with a, with a call agent. Um, those calls are identified every night, and they're marked off, and they're, and they, you know, they take the files, the, you know, the MP3s or whatever they have, and they mark them off for training purposes. So new call center agents can listen to those fresh calls and learn how to be better call center agents. And then the one thing that, they, that, that vendors wouldn't talk to me about, but I know they do it. They got to do it. You know, people use profanity. You want to look if you're at, in a call center. You want to look at the angry customer. You want to look at. Um, whether or not you're, you're, uh, the guy's answering the phone, um, you know, why is your problem with this call? Is it a bad customer because he's profane or highly sensitive? I know that whenever I get on the phone with Verizon, I, my blood pressure spikes about five points and I start swearing and I don't know why. I just can't control myself. Um, yeah, I know. It's a phone company. You should always do that. Um, or is it a bad business product? Process is a bad product. Or does the agent need to improve or polish the way he handles the customer? Um, word spotting um, for real-time competitive in intelligence, like I said, inbound calls are a massive source of um, data on uh, customer and market trends, and they're used, word spotting is used uh, for competitive intelligence. Look for the name or mention of, of um, a competitor or mention a, a special offer, great offer, or other type of switch. Let me give you a real-world example. Um, I switched from my long-distance phone service from um, AT&T to um, one of those Cox um, over there. Cox's cable service for a flat rate, and I had to call up at and I had to call up at and in order to cancel my long distance service on the phone line. Um, and the first question he goes, "Well, why are you leaving us?" I said, "Well, I got an offer from Cox because they got a better, you know, because I got a flat rate price." Guess what? That information's recorded along with all the other cancellation calls, and every night they crunch through, and companies can look at this. Every uh, you know, look at the batch run, um, the resulting report in the morning, and identify in real time. You know, is somebody doing an offer in a certain part of the country that um, cutting into our business? Okay, they can identify that, they can respond to that, and they can modify their marketing and sales strategies in real time, rather than five to ten months later with sales down by five to ten percent. Um, and then, of course, you can also use the data genify to, to generate things like profiles of good customers or bad or trouble customers. Um, let's get this. One of the companies that's in the um, in this business is a company called uh, nice, nice Systems. Um, they're traded on NASDAQ. They made $311 million last year. Um, they're what I call the Microsoft of voice analytics. Some people may argue with me about that, but um, they've got 23,000 customers they, may, they lay claim to with all of their products. Um, including 75 of the Fortune 100, and their customers include American Express, Citibank, FedEx, Home Depot, Nextel, Time Warner, and Photo, uh, Vodafone. And the interesting thing when they talk about their um, voice analytics solution, they emphasize the fact that um, 
you know, they improve business and operational performance, and they also address the fact that they can find security threats and allow um, people to identify security threats and be proactive to those security threats when they call in. Now, the interesting thing about NICE systems is that they support Nortel, Cisco, Avaya, um, all of the name brands. Um, you can link up the voice recording with other uh, tools in line like IM and screen lookup so you can build these elaborate models um, for analyzing call content with other data sources. And then uh, they've also got a module that if you want to write a check big enough, you can tie that straight into an SAS um, analytical package so you can do statistics to your heart's content. Um, now the baseline analytics package from these that's about um, 100 grand, um, but obviously stalling Quill is much cheaper. Um, again, voice storage, everybody's storing data. You know, you can do a single PC, you know, PC type box uh, running Windows XP, record up to 40 calls on it, 55,000 hours of video on it. Um, and, and then Nice thinks that everybody should store things, and you look at the trend, customer trends. You look at the trends in, industry, in, in the enterprise space today. Everybody's got an IPPDX is thinking about storing their calls um, because they think they can do something with the data. Okay, again, commercial volume. Let's get those liability requirements. Uh, just liability requirements, real quick. Why do people record or get neurotic about it? Um, uh, people in the health and the care industry have the HIPAA regulation. Um, they feel they have to track communications to ensure confidentiality of information. From a financial perspective, um, companies want to monitor for leakage of information for insider trading. Um, and then you've got Sarbanes-Oxley. So everybody's paranoid about what the requirements for Sarbanes-Oxley are. So lawyers have skewed things to overkill. So um, companies are now providing audit trails of calls and monitoring. And we talked about that. Well, how do you use this, all these techniques to defend against social engineering? Um, an interesting data point when I was going researching, there's a company called Vosin. Anybody from Vosin? No? Um, they had a white paper on their website that said social engineering and identity theft, how criminals exploit your call center. That white paper is now removed from their website. Um, social engineering, a lot of times, is the way in um, in order to break security. An outside caller impersonates an insider or calls in and, and tries to get information. Um, that, um, such as phone numbers, passwords, um, you know, websites, things like that, uh, names of equipment. So they can gather a number of pieces of, of information so they can build a mosaic that they can use to, do, to ultimately direct their attacks and, and break into systems. Um, and despite written procedures, user education, um, you know, public blogging, um, social engineering is, a, is still an effective way to, to breach corporate security. But if you're monitoring all phone calls and you're recording all phone calls um, through an IP PBX, um, all of a sudden you've got a bunch of software tools you can apply to that IP PBX, um, such as whitelisting, blacklisting, word spotting, and um, voice analytics to spot attack um, and in some cases be able to respond to them in near real time. Um, we're not talking about um, uh, blue sky technology. Again, you've got larger organizations um, using voice analytics today. Um, so building this is as simple as plugging in a server and um, analyzing recorded phone calls or analyzing calls in real time. Um, the most the toughest task is building a, a rule set to look at words, look at conversations, and being able to dig through them. The one key thing is that the, the secret sauce here is, is that the most expensive part of, of um, voice analytics is that, again, that um, speech to text engine, um, being able to do that well and do that in real time or, or fast enough to be near real time, that's pretty expensive. So larger organizations are going to are first implementing this, again, larger call centers. Um, but as the price goes down, you're going to start to see more and more people analyze inbound calls. Whitelist, voice printed identification. Again, uh, my voice is my, my passport. Um, it's the most common use today when you talk about analyzing um, phone calls. Um, 
for security purposes. Um, and right now, most companies are using it as an in-house to either authenticate people who are outside, who call in all the time, such as technicians or IT staff. Um, and some of them, the more stricter ones, are using them to authenticate all staff who call in. Um, you know, again, lawyers, the paranoid. Um, but uh, whitelisting or voice print is becoming more important because you can spoof caller ID. I mean, it, it's almost a de facto standard. I don't want to say de facto standard, but um, pretty much that you know you can spoof caller ID pretty much six different. I don't want to say six different ways, but you know a number of different ways. Um, so you can't use caller ID to authenticate people. You need to have another thing, and that other thing is going to be voice print. Blacklist. If you know who your bad actors are. If you know that, that somebody's, you know, um, somebody's been, if you can identify somebody who's, who's trying to defraud you and, you and you know their voice print, you can use that voice print to filter through calls and identify um, identify that person and block them out of the system. Um, you could either use, if, you, if you're using voice print as a blacklist, you could either flag or deny um, somebody access to the rest of the phone system, um, or if you want to be cruel, you can send them into voice attendant hell and they just have to go four or three and try to reach a real person. Um, blacklist with sharing is also interesting. More and more um, insurance companies realize that, that you know if they've got a, somebody trying to defraud them five to ten, um, one insurance company realizes that you've got somebody trying to defraud them, then you know insurance, the, their competitors also have that problem. It's in their best interest to identify that bad actor and make sure that neither one of them get ripped off. So more and more insurance companies are starting to share that data. Um, word spotting. Um, again, you can build a, a, a vocabulary of words that can get monitored and, and look for. If you have somebody calling in and they're asking for a password or they're asking for user logins or they're asking for more sensitive information like you know, can you tell me the phone number of the CEO? I need to get a hold of him because it's an emergency. Um, you know, anybody who's trying to, to run a social engineering um, um, attack may make more than one phone call to see if he can get the information. And he's going to ask basically the same question. Um, if you can identify keywords, um, then you can search for a vocabulary of words um, that will set off flags. Um, and you can go ahead and take further action. Um, and if you cross match that with caller ID, assuming caller ID is not spooked, I mean, if somebody's asking about passwords and they're, you know, on a phone across the street or a phone that you I can't identify, then that's an obvious flag that um, there's something wrong. Now, word spotting, if you're going to use that for um, a security purposes, um, you're likely going to have to establish baseline or threshold to prevent false alarms. Because let's face it, large organizations, again, somebody's going to forget their um, login, they're going to forget their password. Um, if you've built up a more sophisticated vocabulary, depending upon how paranoid you are, um, if somebody calls in asking about your routers, is that a hacker or is that a sales guy? Well, if it's a sales guy, you know, if, it, if it's a sales guy from Juniper and he wants to sell you upgrades to your, you know, he wants to, um, sell you upgrades on your gear, well, then that doesn't have to sound an alarm. But um, if somebody's calling in asking about your um, asking about your router gear and you don't know them from Adam, then that's an area of concern as well. Probably, unfortunately, um, I suspect that um, initially um, voice analytics is going to be get used a lot for post-attack reconstruction. A company's going to get hit. Um, they're going to realize that they've been compromised, and through some means, they've, they've realized to identify a bad actor um, through their voice print word spotting. Once they've identified a, a single phone call where where um, where an attacker has um, called in, they can go ahead and use that information and figure out, okay, how many phone calls did this guy make? What information did he ask for? So they can go back through a log of calls, and they can trace back who was called, identify the methods that this guy used in order to get the information, and identify what information was used to compromise the company. Um, and once you've got that information, of course, 
you can generate a, a, a full time stamped audit trail as to who called, when they called, and you know, again, where they called it, if caller ID wasn't compromised. Um, on the other hand, uh, hackers aren't stupid. Um, anybody trying to compromise your system may be aware that you know you may use uh, voice analytics against you. So they may have tactics to get around um, a high-tech electronic filtering system. Um, and they all, and on the other side of the coin, you'll be able to take countermeasures in order to um, prevent um, these methods from being compromised. Whitelist. Um, again, um, if you look at sneakers, my voice is my passport. And then you had you know, somebody using a, a tape recorder, and then you had this whole elaborate scene where, where this woman was trying to get this geek to say passport. Um, these days, um, you don't need a tape recorder. You can just use anything like, oh, I don't know, an iPod to record, or a, uh, an MP3 player to record somebody's voice print, or, and then use a laptop to polish up the product. You can play it on an iPod, you can play it on an MP3 player. Um, in order to, to simulate a voice print. Now, the countermeasure for for that is if somebody's trying to, to beat voice print with a can thing, um, you can use emotion detection. Because if somebody's playing you a canned response, they're not going to be able to spike, make things happy, make things sad. Um, but the underlying software analyzing the call can detect that. Um, another countermeasure that people are going to uses um, what I call the phrase that, that pays. Um, when you go into HR to um, get your voice print logged in in the future, they're going to give you a list of 25 random words to repeat. They can get a, a voice print and a vocabulary that they can recognize you by. Now what's going to happen is if, they need to, uh, if you need to be authenticated in an automated fashion, you'll have some sort of daily random generated phrase um, that you'll have to repeat on the fly, and then you'll have a certain amount of time in order to repeat that phrase in order to be authenticated. And that's going to be much harder to smooth rather than a, a single sentence um, cam phrase. Um, you know, especially if you're trying to, you know, just, you're not going to be able to kind of paste words that fast. Um, word spotting. Um, it's a little bit harder to beat, but people are going to be creative about it. I mean, if, if, if uh, an attacker knows that you have certain hot words that you look for, like password, um, like user ID. They'll, they'll probably try to use um, you know, some sort of substituted phrases. Um, but that could also be very hot, awkward. You know, if, if you're going to ask somebody for their user ID and password, you know, what's a synonym for user ID? You know, your login. OK, well, we'll put that in the, the, uh, the vocabulary we'll analyze and so forth. Um, alternatively, if somebody's running an a, a attack and they realize that you're, you're looking for words, um, people are going to be running a slow attack to avoid that baseline or threshold of things. Because again, um, you know, you're going to have a certain amount of phone calls during the, the course of the day where people are talking about passwords, either getting a new password set up, or you know, again, the, if you're looking for routers as your hot word, you know, you're, you're Juniper rep's going to call him to try to sell you X, Y, Z, and he's going to talk about routers. Um, the, the canny hacker, the tag, canny attacker, is probably going to do something where he makes a call a day or a call per week, something that doesn't set off alarms, but something that you know he can gather um, the information he needs and build his mosaic. It's going to take him longer, but he'll still do it. Alternatively, um, the attacker can try to get as much needed information all the needed information he needs as fast as possible um, to set up an attack, um, gather it, build his picture, go in, break the system, and get out, um, all before security has a chance to react. But that's a little bit, it's going to be a lot trickier um, if, there's a, if there's, a, you know, there's a lot of key pieces of information he or she needs. Um, and again, countermeasures for word spotting, you know, you can build rule sets if, then, else, as, ands. Um, to match keywords to your heart's content, um, you know, it'll increase your rate of false positives or alarms. But um, you know, some people are going to live that. And again, you can also um, mix keyword monitoring with unique voice print. 
So how do you beat the blacklist? You know, let's say, for instance, I have um, Kevin Mitnick's um, voice print on file. Well, all Kevin has to do is get a, a friend or a, a circle of friends to go and ask a question at a time um, for a social engineering attack um, and gather the information that way. You don't have to be the sole actor involved to gather information in order to, to, to beat a blacklist. On the other hand, it requires multiple people to be involved. Well, how many people can you can you have involved? And I, I you know, saw this in you know Benjamin Franklin. How many saw that and thought of Karl Rove or Dick Cheney? You know, three can keep a secret if two are dead. Okay, the more people you have involved in terms of an attack, um, the larger the potential for leaks, the larger for potential of just you know having to deal with psychodrama. I mean, have things get more complicated. Um, Another countermeasure, again, is the shared blacklist. Um, companies are going to share blacklists of voice prints. Um, um, if they share them around in real time, social engineering attacks are going to get detected faster. Tactics, I love this one. Hack the analytics box. Uh, voice analytics systems, most of them are Windows-based. Um, your best case is that if you, you um, have an analytics box running and um, it goes through some sort of denial of service or the, the, the server crashes for some unknown reason, well, hey, guess what? That gives you an indication you're being attacked. Um, now, the attack crash is going to give you a, a date or time for uh, when you might have been penetrated. Worst case is if somebody owns the box and understands the software, um, everything on the box is fair game, and they're going to be able to edit whitelist, blacklist, vocabulary, monitor phrases. Um, so. The countermeasure to that is uh, secure an analytics box um, just that's going to process voice just like you would anything else. You know, you got to secure physically, you got to secure the network. Um, and then the one thing I think that goes without saying is that whoever operates this box has to be a trusted character because if he's an inside guy, then this layer of security is blown if, if he's the guy that's crashing your network. Summary. Okay. Again. Voice analytics is being used today in, in call centers, um, in the Fortune 500, and, and um, government applications um, to spot um, fraud, to identify people. Um, again, the insurance companies are the big ones. They want to save money. Um, they want to catch um, people trying to rip them off. The software technology is not cheap, but prices are likely to decline. Again, the most expensive piece of um, technology in building a voice analytics system is is the is basically the speech to text engine um, because disks are cheap, drives are cheap, servers are cheap, um, and then your first implementations of um, um, people who are, are are implementing this technology are um, high security, high risk organizations. Again, you know, who's going to do uh, Identity theft, um, that sort of thing. Food for thought. Again, this technology is so cheap, anybody can do it. So you don't have to worry, you know, people shouldn't worry about Echelon USA. People should worry about Echelon Sweden or Echelon China or Echelon Russia. Um, the gear is cheap. The software is off the shelf. I mean, these systems is based in Israel. It's not too much of a stretch to think that Israel may have the capability for their own little... Um, voice analytics thing. All they need to do is be able to get access to a um, uh, telephone call flow um, in countries they may be interested in, like, I don't know, Lebanon, and um, um, sort through that stuff and ID and, and fill out a voice print ID so they can go find them. Um, uh, go find people. Um, and again, it's not only nation states that have this capability. New York City could pay for a capability like this. New York City has, you know, thousands of cops, and I don't know how much their budget is, but you know, they've got a multi-billion-dollar, multi-billion-dollar police budget. But anyways, you know, um, for somebody like New York City to build their own um, system to process through phone calls and um, find people by voice print ID is, is not a big stretch of the imagination. It's not just for Big Brother anymore. Um, in terms of the U.S. government, it's, it's any government that um, can go buy the software. Um, corporate government, true. Well, um, you've got no privacy. Um, again, the trend is if you've got an IPPDX, the next step is, well, we want to record all phone calls in and out because we want to analyze the data or we want to protect ourselves. Um, the downside of this is um, 
if you work for an exceptionally paranoid um, private employer, you can monitor phone calls for things like if you're looking for a new job, you call your boss a fuckhead once too often. You know, I mean, it's you know, it's it's, it's easy enough to do. Um, and then finally, if you thought that um, you know DNA was bad, that is, if you leave your DNA everywhere, well, your voice print, you know. Um, you can pull that off of speeches, pull that off of public conversations, phone calls, podcasting. Your voice can be found everywhere. Um, BBN actually has a service where um, they're taking podcasts, they're doing speech to text, and then they're indexing um, podcasts based upon the uh, the words in a, in, a, in, a, in podcasts on the internet. Um, you know, it, it, one step beyond that is you can use um, you know build your own um, database or index of, of voice print IDs to identify people, um, which brings us to Google Voice. One day, somebody like Google or somebody else may actually have a database of verified um, voice print that people can access to, to make sure that um, if you're calling, if somebody calls you and their caller ID says X, um, you may be able to punch a button and feed their voice print over to Google, and Google may be able to go these are verified, and then you can go talk to them. So, my email address again on notes. Any questions, comments? Yes, sir. Well, I think that. Um, they're kind of focused on, they're more focused on the U.S. government. They're less focused on, on, on big business because, frankly, um, the, your, the, you know, your, your privacy, quote unquote, um, in, in the workplace is, is practically nil because your employer has the right to read through your email if it's sitting on their server. The employer has the right to look at, um, inbound email traffic to determine if you're looking at porn on company time, um, your employer does indeed have the right to monitor your calls with a couple of exceptions. Um, I, one of the exceptions is that they can't monitor a um, call between you and your doctor, and I forget what the other one is. Probably I like, can't monitor a call between you and your lawyer, but guess what? If you're running an IPPBX and everything's getting recorded, how do you sort that out? Is there a button on your phone that you press and mark privacy? You know, that, I think that you know, longer term is that you accept the fact you have no rights as, and when you work for a, a company other than being a sole proprietor and use your cell phone if you have to make personal calls. Yeah, the days of phone sex on the phone sex at the office, they're gone. To be flippant, but to, to go back to your your question, um, I haven't. You know, it hasn't become a big deal yet. Um, just because I think it's a battle that they're not really thinking about at this time. You know, they're more worried that they're, they're, they they have a limited number of lawyers, and their their focus more now is more on at the government level um, what the U.S. government is doing, um, rather than thinking about what corporations are doing. You know, and and they have got a tough road to battle because again, um, you go for an employer, you, you don't have a lot of rights. I mean, as an employee, you don't have a lot of rights. Yes. What? I'd say, well, if it's a can, if it's a, if it, again, if, it, if, if it's a canned phrase, it's fairly easy to spoof voice print. Okay, if it's, I mean, you know, you start getting to do what's the quality of, of, of the sample that you've got, right? And I'm assuming if you've got a good sample, if you've got a good sample, and if you've got a canned, um, and if you've, if you've got a, a canned phrase or can a small set of words, then then working a spoof for voice print isn't that hard. Again, you go back to sneakers. Um, I don't know. Did you see the movie Sneakers? Pardon? MIT. Okay, so you know, 
it's, you know, let's just say that for, for a small, again, if, if for a limited set of, of items or phrases, it's, it's probably within the realm of possibility. Once you start using more words or phrases, then it becomes harder to speak voice print. So there's not, there's not a lot about it. There's, you know, because you start getting into, okay, well, how many words do you know that you have prints on? And, and, you, and, and you start getting into a lot of variables. Okay, well, how is the sample taken and things like that? You know, so. Because each word you say is going to have its own unique characteristics. And how you string them together, that's going to be another set of unique characteristics. So, other questions? Yep, I guess the top's it. Thank you very much.